verse 11 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verses 12 and 13 will also be our text for this message today. We're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit of God. In Zechariah, an Old Testament writing, instruction had been given to Zerubbabel. And this man was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem after the exiles had returned. And he was to lead the exiles in doing this. But it was very problematic for them because uh, the returning exiles, you'd characterize them with these words. They were weak, they were tired, they were discouraged, they were poor, and they were harassed by their enemies. And they could have thought this is absolutely impossible. There's no way that we can do this. And God gave a message to Zerubbabel that uh, through him this message was to be communicated to these exiles. And it said just this, it's not by might, nor by power, not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, saith the Lord. You know, many people in our world today, and maybe many of you, I don't know, maybe you feel that uh, to survive in the world in which we're living, that you've got to be a person who's tough, strong, unbending, at times harsh. That's how I make my way through this world. That's how I deal with the issues that I have to deal with. And the words of the Lord that He gave to Zerubbabel certainly pertain to all of us. It's not by might, your might. It's not by your power, but it's by God's Spirit. And you may be in a place in your life where you feel just like these exiles, as I described for you just a moment ago, that that you're tired, and maybe you're poor, or you're struggling in some fashion, and you look at the challenges that you have to face in your life, and you just think, there's no way this can happen. Remember these words. God doesn't tell you to face your temptations, to deal with your problems, your trials, your challenges by your strength, by your ingenuity, by your might. He says, not by might, it's not by power, it's by my spirit. By the Holy Spirit, saith the Lord. And I would say this is a message not just for those who struggle in life, but for those of you who seem to be prospering and everything's going excellent for you. This coming Friday, it will be the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States. And many of us were alive. I was a ninth grader when that took place, and I remember it just like it was yesterday. And President Kennedy, when he had come to Texas, he'd received warm welcomes. When he was in San Antonio, when he was in Houston, massive crowds were there. Even when he came to Dallas, huge crowds were at Love Field and all the way through the streets of Dallas, Texas. And here's the President of the United States. He's 46 years of age. He's he's handsome. He's the most powerful man in the world. He is exceedingly wealthy. He didn't even take a salary to be the president. He had so much money. He had a gorgeous wife. He had every single thing that you would think that a person would need. And here's the man, the most powerful man in the world. And in an instant, his life was over. So listen, when we think about living life and facing life, don't don't be so egotistical that you think, oh, look what I've done. It's by my might. It's by my power that I brought myself to this position that I'm in and all the success that I have. No, it's by God's grace and God's blessing upon your life that He's given you those skills. It's only by God's grace and mercy that we'll live another day. We can have things go wrong with us in an instant. Something physically, something mentally can go wrong. Charles Haddon Spurgeon that Tom just read that quote from, Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached in front of four or 5,000 people on Sunday evening in London years ago. Every single Sunday evening, thousands would gather to hear him. Do you know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon struggled with depression, deep depression, many times in his life? It was only by God's grace and by God's Spirit working in his life that enabled him to deal with things he had to deal with. I remember when President Kennedy was assassinated, right after that, Billy Graham brought a message on the Arab decision. And I didn't hear it then, but I read it later. And Billy Graham was one year younger than John F. Kennedy, and they were friends. And he just said in this message, who would have ever thought, when the president was touring through Dallas, that his life would be over in an instant. And that here on this, he preached this on a Sunday after the assassination, that here the president's body's lying in state in the capital rotunda, who would have ever considered that? 
And then he just called people who'd listen to that message. You'd better look to Christ. You'd better trust in Christ. It's His strength, His anointing, His spirit that we need in our lives. Well, when I read this statement from Zechariah, it sort of reminds me of the importance for you and I as believers to understand as much as we possibly can about the Holy Spirit of God. And this subject we're talking about today, the baptism of the Spirit, has brought some confusion, great confusion, to the lives of numbers of people in the believing world. And so I want us to look at some different things. It's amazing how even as believers we have a way of clouding up the issues and making things difficult to understand when they, when they should not be. And it's abundantly clear when you think about this baptism of the Spirit. So I want us to deal with some of these issues. First of all, let's think about this. Who is the baptizer? When you think the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who's the baptizer? Well, you read Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, and John the Baptist makes this statement. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. And he's speaking of Jesus. And then he says this, He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So it looks like Jesus is the baptizer. But now hold your place there and look over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. And the Apostle Paul writes these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. He says the body, and he's talking about the church, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Just like the human body, so it is with the body of Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit. Saying there, the Holy Spirit's the baptizer. We're baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all given one Spirit to drink. Well, which is it? John says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 that we were baptized by the Spirit. It's right here. Some people will say, well, look, it's two different experiences that you have. Well, are there two different baptisms? Is that what these verses are speaking of? That's what some have proposed, and that is uh, not the case. But some will read this passage in Matthew chapter 3 and say Jesus baptizes you in a certain way and then later on you can receive another type of baptism. Well, how do you explain this? Well, you have to understand this. The Gospels record the life of Christ before His ascension unto heaven. And what had to happen before there could ever be a baptism of the Spirit? They could not receive this in the Old Testament. We saw in a previous message that the Spirit of God could anoint certain ones, but He only did certain ones, and He did not indwell them as He does the believing world today. We're at a tremendous advantage that they did not have. And so we look at this, and we stop and think, well, all right, what has to occur? If, if the Spirit of God is going to invade our lives, which had never happened before, what must take place? Well, this had to occur Christ had to die on a cross for the sins of the world. He had to conquer death. He had to come forth from the grave. And He had to ascend unto heaven. You thought, well, why? Why did all that have to happen? Because atonement for our sins had to be made. Our sins had to be paid for so that God could justify us, so that He could declare us not guilty of our sins. It's only then that the Spirit of God could come into our life. And furthermore, according to the words of the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God could not come to us in the way that He has come unless Jesus ascended unto heaven. And listen, don't be confused on this. Don't think, well, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God was not in the world until Jesus sent Him at Pentecost. That's incorrect. The Spirit of God is always in the world. But he could not come to indwell the life of the believer until Jesus had died on the cross, come forth from the grave, and ascended unto heaven. Look in John's gospel at a couple of verses. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7 in verse 39. In fact, in verse 37, let's just start there. It says, 
On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who had believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And then Christ made the statement in John chapter 16 verse 7. He told him, he said, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I don't go away, the Comforter cannot come, the Holy Spirit cannot come to you. But when I've gone, I will send him unto you. So those things had to transpire before this could occur. And in the Gospels, it's interesting. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to find this. The only place it's where it speaks about a baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the gospel writers are quoting John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, 11, our text. Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Mark records the same statement. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Luke does as well. And then John chapter 1, in verse 33. But all those gospel writers speak of this. Now that should underscore for us the importance of this baptism of the Spirit because every gospel writer wrote about it. But that is the only place in the Gospels that you read of it. Nowhere else in the Gospels does it talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says then the Holy Spirit was given. And this was the gift of Jesus to the believing world. This was the gift of Jesus to His church. And in this sense only, Jesus was the baptizer. He sent the Holy Spirit to indwell our lives. And when He ascended unto heaven and sent the Spirit in that way, He is the baptizer in that respect. But after Pentecost, from that time on, the Holy Spirit is the one who initiates and brings about this baptism. Jesus is the ultimate source because He makes it possible and He sends the Spirit. But after Pentecost the Holy Spirit does the actual baptizing. So we're not talking here two different baptisms. Don't read Matthew 3.11 or any of these other gospel verses I quoted and then read over in 1 Corinthians 12 and tell you, what we got two different baptisms on our hand. Jesus does it in one way and the Holy Spirit does it. No, no, not at all. Well, then here's the second thought I want us to consider. When does the baptism of the Holy Spirit take place? Because there are various opinions about this. And there are many people who stress this. You receive Jesus at one point in your life, and then later you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, now, is that correct according to the Scripture? And where in the world do people get this? Where do they come up with this teaching? Well, let me show you some places. Look in the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2 describes for us Pentecost. And these verses are easy to explain. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But the Spirit came upon their lives at that time, and it refers there to the filling. But the baptism took place immediately when the Spirit of God came to their lives. Now, certainly they had to wait because Jesus explained to them, I have to ascend before He can come. So that's easy to explain. But look over here in Acts chapter 8. This is not so easy. Here the church is being persecuted and these believers, these Jewish Christians are scattered in all different regions and now they're in Samaria. (coughs) And while they were preaching, there were many of the Samaritans that gave their life to Christ. But look what it says in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. 
They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. I don't know how in the world do you explain that? Because Jesus already ascended, the Holy Spirit had already come, and yet here at Samaria, the gospel is preached to them, they give their lives to Christ, and yet the Spirit had not come to them yet. They had not received the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, until Peter and John came. Here's what we have to understand. In certain instances, God can do whatever He wants to do. And the Lord knew the situation. He knew it well here. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They could not stand each other. And I'm just speaking collectively. There were some that were respectful of each other, like the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told. But for the most part, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. And so to convince the believers, the Jewish believers, that these Samaritans had indeed been saved, the Lord just waits to send the Spirit until Peter and John get there so that there could be eyewitness accounts, and Peter later goes and gives testimony to the ones in Jerusalem that these people have had this similar experience and that they have received Christ and that He has received them. That's why. That's the only place that I can find in the New Testament where it was waited other than Pentecost. Let me show you another passage. Look in Acts chapter 9. People use the Apostle Paul sometimes. Here he was, Saul of Tarsus. He's a persecutor of the church. He's on the Damascus road and a blinding light strikes him. And the Lord says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, well, who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting? He said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And so people feel, believers feel, that at that time Saul of Tarsus yielded his life. He humbled his life before Christ. But now if you read through these verses... You come to verse 9, and it says this. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And the Lord goes to Ananias and speaks to Ananias. He's called him in a vision. It says in verse 10. And he said, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul because he's praying and in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. And Ananias was very apprehensive. He said, well, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to the saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And the Lord said, Ananias, you go ahead and go. Because this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so some of these will say, well, look, here's Saul of Tarsus. Damascus Road, he's converted, but three days he's blind, and Ananias goes, and then he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And they say they equate the filling and the baptism, the same thing. Well, the filling and the baptism are not the same thing. Well, listen, a person, when they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh, yes, they can experience the filling, but even after we've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, We have to be filled, we'll see this in a later study, all the rest of our life. So this isn't saying that Saul of Tarsus was baptized with the Holy Spirit three days later. That happened to him when he gave his life to Christ. And then there's this passage. Look in Acts chapter 10. It speaks of a man named Cornelius. He's a Gentile. And they'll say, well, Cornelius... Cornelius was saved and then later he received the Spirit because they conclude sometimes he's saved because of the statements made in these first three verses. It says, In Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, is what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. And one day about three in the afternoon he had a vision he distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. 
And Cornelius said, well, Lord, what is it? And the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. And then he tells him, you send to a certain area, send men for Peter, and he's going to come and bring you a message. Well, now people read that verse and say, well, Cornelius has to be saved. I mean, look at this. The man, it says, is God-fearing. He's devout. He gave generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. He even has a vision where a spiritual being, an angel, communicates with him. You think, this guy's got to be saved. I mean, a lost person can't have those things happen to them. See, a lot of times we make assumptions we shouldn't make because Cornelius was not saved. You think all those things can occur in a person's life and they're not saved? Exactly right. And how do we know this? Well, you look over here a little bit further. In Acts, this same chapter, when Peter comes to him, in verse 34 and following, Peter tells about what's, what's occurring. And he says this to Cornelius. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. But he accepts men from every nation who fear and do what is right. You know the message. God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what was happening throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went around doing good and healing, and all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. And we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead. And on the third day, and he caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. And while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard that message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on these Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Some would say, well, here Cornelius, this devout man who prayed to God, who gave to the poor, who had a vision, he's already saved, so now when Peter comes, he receives the Holy Spirit. No, that's not it. This devout man who prayed to God was lost in his sin. How do we know that? Well, if he was already saved, Peter would not have come and presented the gospel to him. He would have come to him and spoken to him as a brother in Christ and said, let me tell you how to grow in your faith. But he goes to him and he presents the gospel message in Cornelius. These passages where it says the Holy Spirit came upon him, that's when he's giving his life to Christ. And you can see that to be true if you look in Acts chapter 11. Because here's what it says. Peter's now explaining to the brothers in Judea because they'd heard this and they were critical of Peter at first. They didn't buy into this. Why, these are Gentiles. And Peter makes this statement, Acts 11, verse 14 and following. It says, He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. And he's he's recounting their experience with Cornelius. But he's saying, God told me that I'll deliver this message through which Cornelius and his household will be saved. So there was a different time. Cornelius was saved when Peter went and preached and received the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit at that time of his conversion. It wasn't two different times. But listen, just very quickly, I want to say this. All of us need to wake up to the fact, don't you be deceived. Somebody says, well, I believe in God. I believe in God. I even pray to God. And I pray for our nation. And I pray for people around me. And I try to live a good life. And I try to give. I've tried to give to the Philippines and give to others who have needs in their life. So I must be all right. I must be saved because I do that. That doesn't mean you're saved at all. Not at all. This man Cornelius did all of that. And he was not saved until Peter went and shared the gospel of Christ with him then. 
he gave his life to Christ. So please understand that. Now one other passage, let me show you real quick. Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul is now dealing with believers who are followers of John the Baptist. In Acts 19, beginning in verse 1, it says, When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and traveled at Ephesus. He arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And again, you could say, Oh, well now, they're believers. They believed. Well, no, look what they're believing in. They answer, Well, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he asked them, Well, then what baptism did you receive? They said, John's baptism. And Paul explained to them, well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But he told the people this, which these men had not done as of yet, to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. You're to believe in Jesus. And on hearing this, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is when they gave their life to Christ. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied and there were about 12 men at all. But it wasn't a different time. They received the baptism when they asked Christ into their lives. But that can be very confusing. People can come and tell you that. Well, yeah, you get Jesus here, and you get the Holy Spirit later on. Well, here's the final thing I just want to mention to you this morning. In the New Testament, we are never told to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Never. You read through it all you want to. You will never find one time where it tells you as a believer you are to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there are people out here in the Christian world that will tell you that's exactly what you need to do. And because believers don't understand what we're talking about this morning, they get very confused and they can be led astray by people who would misconstrue these passages of Scripture. When I took a trip to Israel some years back, I was with... uh, People I did not know. I I got to know them, became friends with them. And they're believers. They're all believers, but uh, some of different persuasions. And I remember at lunch one day, there was a little break, and there was a guy talking to another person. And the man said this. The man said, you know, I received Jesus as my Savior, but there wasn't a lot of change in my life. And I just, I didn't have all this joy. And I struggled some in my life. And he said, I got to a point where I thought, is this all there is? Is this all there is? This isn't what it was made up to be to me. But then he said this. Then I heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I started seeking the baptism, and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then my life changed. Well, what do you say when somebody says that to you? That's their experience. Well, I just say this. I'm not saying that a person can't. You can receive Jesus, and if you don't get into a church and get in with believers who can help you grow, you can revert very quickly into a state of carnality. You can do that where you don't experience much change and you still fall to the temptations that are before you and you wrestle with that. Certainly that can happen. And then later on in your walk, somebody can introduce you to teachings of the Scripture and you can draw close to the Lord Jesus and Christ becomes more meaningful to you, more personal to you, and your life then begins to change because He's in control of your life. And I believe that's what happened to the guy. But that's not the baptism of the Spirit. Don't don't be confused. A lot of people spend their time, just want to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've got to have the baptism of the Spirit. The New Testament never tells us to seek this baptism. Why? Because it happens to you automatically when you receive Jesus as your Savior. I wonder how many believers in this room really understood the day that you accept Christ, the moment that you accept Christ as your Savior, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit of God in that moment. In that moment. But the Bible says you're never to seek this. never tells us that. Now the Bible tells us to seek this and to be obedient to this. The Bible tells us to be obedient to water baptism. Jesus told us that. In the Great Commission, when he told his followers, he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me.
And he said, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And then I want you to do this. He said, I'm commanding you to do this. You baptize them. That's a command not just to those disciples, but to the people who are being converted to Christ. Jesus says, I'm commanding you to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing to me how many people will say, well, I'll tell you, I've accepted Jesus, but I don't want to do that. And it's just embarrassing to me, and I don't want to have to go to the trouble of getting up and getting down in water. And, uh, you know, I just I don't like that. Well, listen, this is not an issue between you and some minister like me or you and your husband, your wife, or your, your mom and dad. You're not to do that to please your parents or please your wife or your husband or to please me. This is Jesus. Jesus is the one who says, you give your life to me, then I want you to be baptized. So he commands us to do that and to seek that. And then he commands us, the Bible commands us to do this, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to reiterate, and I'll say it again in another message, the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit are two different things entirely. But the Bible says you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you're to seek this. It says in Ephesians in chapter 5 in verse 18, just listen to this verse, the Apostle Paul he makes this statement. He says, do not get drunk on wine. Well, that's a timely word for this day and age, and really for all ages. Read throughout the Bible how people were drunkards and spend their time doing that, and they do it today. And he says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Don't be under the control of intoxicating drink. You be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God but be filled with the Spirit. But that's what he tells you to seek. Never tells you to seek the baptism. Well, listen, when you think about the Spirit of God, here's one work that he does in our life, but never, never underestimate the importance of the Spirit's work in your life. Don't buy into this, well, it's by my might. It's by my strength. It's by my wisdom, my intellect. My capability, all that can be taken away in a split second. As the Lord told Zerubbabel, the same is true for us. Look, it's not by your might. It's not by your power that you can leave a, a meaningful legacy behind, that you can live a meaningful life in this world and have impact for Christ and deal with temptations in a victorious way and be the representative that Christ wants you to be. And be the person in your family, in your business that He wants you to be. It's not by your might. It's not by your power. It is by His Spirit, says the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I just pray that you've given clear instruction this morning. Uh, many things about you we can't comprehend. There's no way we can. But Father, help us not to get sidetracked and start seeking things we don't need to seek, things that have already occurred to us. And I thank you as believers. For those of us who trust you, Jesus, that the moment we gave our lives to you, you baptized us in the Spirit, Spirit of God. You did that in us. And so we thank you and we praise you for that. Help us to know that. But Father, as we look further in these studies, help us to fully grasp what it means to be filled by the Spirit and to let you, Lord Jesus, do this in our lives. And Father, I pray right now for people in the room who they may be just like Cornelius, that story scares me when I think of it in the Bible that a man who's devoted and prayed to you and gave to the poor and was devout was lost. Father, help every single person in here to understand if they have not repented of their sins and ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into their lives to be their Savior, that all that other does not matter, it will not save them. That Jesus, only you can save. It's just as Jordan sang about a moment ago, what a Savior. What a Savior. You're the only Savior. So, Father, for any who need to trust in Jesus, I pray they'll do that this morning.